In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> so, one of the joys and one of the challenges of being an Episcopal priest is that we do not get to choose which readings we are given each Sunday, but must play the hand that we are dealt. So last week it was divorce. This week it is the M word, money. Our Old Testament reading continues the story of Job, who you might remember only last week was defending himself against his wife and against his friends, who insisted he must have done something wrong to deserve such tragedy in his life. And this week, Job is spoiling for a fight, wanting to confront God about what must be a horrible mistake on God's part. And in the Gospel, there is the rich man who finds Jesus only to leave in shock and we are told grieving because he has been told to sell all that he owns and give the money to the poor if he wants to inherit eternal life. And we remember that in Jesus' day, wealth of material possessions, land and family, were all outward indications that you had been blessed by God. All these are the same things that Job lost, and so it is understandable that Job struggles to think that God must have left him for no good reason. And you know, that rich man probably heard the story of Job, and he probably cannot seem to understand how divesting himself of his possessions will bring him closer to God's kingdom. Yet it is in this very paradox we can discover a critical insight about our own ideas of stewardship. Because both Job and that wealthy man had something in common. Actually, they had three things in common. First, they were both righteous and upright, having kept the law. Two, it would seem that each had been rewarded for their fidelity with abundant blessing. And three, both Job and the wealthy man had somehow allowed things to get in the way of relationship. In a very poignant plea at the end of the Old Testament reading, we hear Job grousing about God's absence. Where is God? And the rich man grieves the loss of the fantasy that his wealth and God can somehow share first place in his heart. But at a place deep within him, he knows this isn't true because if wealth alone was all he needed, he wouldn't have followed that empty place in his heart that led him to kneel at the feet of Jesus that day and receive an answer he really did not want to hear. After listening to both of these stories, it is clear to me that relationship and money are very much intertwined for Job for the rich man, and I would guess for all of us as well. No doubt about it, my friends, Jesus is talking about money, specifically our relationship with it. Today we are asked to consider this question. How do we feel about our money? The answer is important because it informs the foundational principle of all stewardship, which is gratitude. The ability to admit humbly that all we have is a gift given to us by a loving God. And I'm going to tell you that for those of us who have worked really hard to get where we are in life, it can sometimes be a challenge to admit that what we have is not really of our own doing. But it is this very idea that informs how we view stewardship, right? Do we see it as giving up, or do we see it as giving back? Giving up implies a posture of scarcity, a fear of not having enough. It's making sure that we have all the things that we want and need first, and then giving back a portion of what we have left over. 
Giving back, on the other hand, assumes a posture of sufficiency. We make an intentional decision to give back to God a portion of whatever we have been given. So if we believe, really, that everything we have is gift, and we decide to give God back, say, 5%, this means that God lets us keep 95% of what he's given us, which I think is pretty good. Right? And we believe that's going to be enough. And as if talking about money isn't disturbing enough for some, the deeper understanding of today's gospel is that it is not just about a sum of money. It is about unencumbering our very lives. You know, at our baptisms, we or our parents offered our lives up over to God, promising that with all that we have and with God's help and with the help of each other, no matter how our lives turn out, we are going to do our best to make sure God gets first place in all of it. We come to this very table every week of a, as a reminder of that promise. We are not being asked to simply empty our bank accounts a little as much as to empty our hearts completely. Today, Jesus challenges us to rid ourselves of all the material things that prevent us from or get in the way of spiritual things. As he reminds his disciples, this includes not only our money, but our families, our jobs, and our possessions. He is not advocating that we abandon our responsibilities towards any of them, although sometimes it's tempting. <laughs> But it makes very clear that we are not to allow anything to get in the way of or take the place of our relationship with God. And he says this won't always be easy or popular, right? Jesus mentions persecutions, which for the early hearers of this word was a very literal possibility. And in our day, it means we have to make some unpopular choices about how we order our lives and what we view as priorities, right? Do we offer our leftovers, our leftover time and energy and money? Or do we offer the first fruits of our lives and our labors? So, how do you feel about your money? I invite you to ponder this deeply and carefully in the few weeks remaining in our stewardship season. And if you have not already mailed in your pledge card, I encourage you to put it in a place where you can pass it often during the day. And when you see it, remember this question and pray about what you will give. And when you fill it out, whatever it is you pledge, I hope that you do so with a truly thankful heart. And I'm going to ask you to remember to bring it with you on October 25th, because we are going to offer you a gift. We are going to offer you the gift of coming forward and placing your completed pledge card on this altar as your offering to God. And if you've already mailed it in, don't worry, we will give you something that will serve as a symbol, right, of that which you have offered. So I say, let's not be like the rich man who turns away in shock because he is afraid of the difficult choice he has to make. Let's instead unburden ourselves of whatever might be keeping us from living a life where our relationship with God is primary, knowing there is no greater gift. Amen.